Um, welcome to our third presentation of the 2021 Stroke Educational Series titled Improving Rapid Access to Time-Sensitive Treatments, a panel discussion. My name is Deb Motes. I'm the QI Quality um, Improvement Business Manager for the American Heart Association, and I will be your moderator today. Everyone has been placed on mute to avoid any background noise or discussions. However, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation by typing them in the chat box on the right hand of your screen and pressing the microphone or pressing the microphone at the bottom of your screen, or if you're using um, your phone audio, press star six to come off mute. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel today. All three of our speakers are experts in stroke care from the Southwest region of the American Heart Association, and they're all actively serve on the Southwest region stroke committee. Um, one of our, our first speaker will be Dr. Margaret Tremwell. Dr. Tremwell is a vascular neurology specialist and medical director of the Washington Regional Stroke Program in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, and our next speaker, second speaker will be Dr. Amir Hassan. He's the head of the neuroscience department, director of endovascular surgical neuroradiology and the director of the clinical neuroresearch, uh, ne neuroscience research at Valley Baptist Medical Center in Harlingen, Texas. In addition, he's the professor of neurology at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley in Harlingen, and he's the president-elect of the Society of Vascular and Interventional Neurology. And our third speaker will be Dr. David Wheeler. He's the medical director of the stroke program at Wyoming uh, Medical Center and the president and manager neurologist at Wyoming Neurological Associates in Casper, Wyoming. In addition, he's the president of the Wyoming Medical Society. Um, I would like to welcome everybody to the presentation, and I will now turn it over to Dr. Tremwell. Hello, my name is Dr. and what I'd like to talk about today is how you might go about uh, process improvement to get your times down for either access to thrombolytic therapy or access to uh, thrombectomies. So the first step that um, is necessary, and it's something that I think is more in a work in progress at present, is just choosing the right scale in the field. There are several scales that have a high sensitivity and a low specificity for detecting strokes, and that would be motor systems, scales that involve mostly motor systems. And so they encompass a lot of strokes, so it's very difficult to avoid a stroke if you're looking at motor systems as being one of the major things that you're looking at, but they are not very specific for a large vessel occlusion. That would be someone that would be most amenable to a thrombectomy. If you look at the cortical symptoms, such as vision or language loss or hemi neglect, those are better um, uh, indicators of a large vessel occlusion. They have a greater sensitivity for it and specificity, but again, because they're certain, uh, Narrowing down to that, they may not have the broad um, ability to bring in all strokes, but they have the best specificity for a large vessel occlusion. So depending on what kind of information you want would depend on what scale that you would um, want to use for um, pre-notification of uh, EMS to the hospital. This is an example or a little table that shows you some of the um, scoring systems that are good for predicting a large vessel occlusion. And then they look at sensitivity, specificity, and then accuracy. And out of those, one of the ones that are most commonly used would be race, and it has an accuracy of 0.82, which is pretty good, 82%. Fast ED is another one that's used, has about 80%. The van, which has um, less trials out there to, to look at, but seems to have an excellent uh, accuracy, with, had an accuracy of 92%. So those are some scales you might consider if you're looking at targeting large vessel occlusion or separating out large vessel occlusion from the general stroke population. In general, when uh, the EMS arrives at the scene, the first thing they of course want to do is their ABCs and that sort of thing. And then they ha should have a routine way of assessing uh, stroke. So use a uniform tool. What we use here in Arkansas across the state is the BFAST. Um, and that and then we add on another scale in some areas to try to detect a large vessel occlusion out of the patients who test positive for the BFAST. 
once that is detected, then there is a protocol that the EMS go through and it involves starting two 20 gauge or larger IVs, one in each antecubital fossa. And the purpose for that is because that's what's needed to get the most accurate CT angiography or CT perfusion study completed. And then also to get a medication list from a family or um, the patient themselves, and then try to get a phone number for the next of kin and informing the next of kin that they should anticipate a call from the emergency department. Lots of times patients or families don't want to answer the phone if they don't know who it is. And so if they can anticipate that there's going to be some unknown number calling them, then they're more likely to answer. And then also to be able to uh, determine the signs and symptoms of stroke and presentation and get an accurate last so well time, which would include why the family or next kin or the witness uh, thought that it started at that time. So it would be like, did they see them well just before the symptoms began and what time was that, that they were last seen well. And then with that information, while they're en route into the hospital to notify with some sort of stroke alert, what we use is called just a stroke alert. The stroke alert actually, uh, once they get to the emergency department, allows the EMS to take the patient directly back to the CT scanner. So they don't stop in a room or anything. And then there's an overhead page, the stroke alert to CT, and then they put what room the patient would go into if they, within the ER after the CT is done. That alerts the ER physician if they're covering that particular room that they need to go to the CT scanner in order to be able to uh, evaluate the patient. The ED physician evaluates the patient and what we say is they have to be in there within 15 minutes and usually they're within one or two minutes. They just go directly back. And then if the last no well time is within a 24 hours of the stroke symptoms pre uh, presenting, then the ER doctor in our institution will page the brain attack team and we call it a bat call. And that brings uh, the neuro provider, which in some hospitals I realize could be the ER physician themselves, but ours it is a distinct neuro provider and the ICU nurse or a, a stroke coordinator with a stretcher and a monitor to the CT scan. So the provider goes down there all by themselves and then the, uh, the nurse coordinator brings the stretcher and this uh, monitor to CT scan. A CT and a CTA of the head and neck are performed as one type of order. You can stop it after the CT if you see that there's something else going on that's a tumor or whatever, and you don't wanna get a CTA, but that the CT is done first with the order to proceed with the CT angiogram of the head and neck to proceed immediately after that. Usually in between the CT and the CTA gives an opportunity for the provider to do that quick neural exam of the NI stroke scale, determine whether the patient is a, as can it get a last known well time. And then while they're preparing the TPA or, or whatever they're doing, um, they can be getting the CT angiogram. CT perfusion is only performed if the last known well time is between six and 24 hours uh, for an anterior circulation stroke. And posterior circulation stroke, sometimes we go out beyond that time window. Within the first six hours after the last no well time, CT perfusion is not absolutely necessary for doing a thrombectomy um, because it's assumed that there is a um, viable penumbra in that period of time. The brain attack team that gets paged for this consists of the CT technician, uh, ER nurse, the neurosurgical ICU coordinator or a stroke coordinator, sorry, hang on a second, and the stroke um, team in-house provider. The neuro provider is who assesses the CT of the head and um, our APNs and PAs have been um, trained in reading CTs, MRIs, and CT angiograms and CT perfusions. And then if the patient meets the inclusion, exclusion, and none of the exclusion criteria for TPA, then right there in the CT scanner room, we have a small pixis that carries the TPA, labetalol, and nicardipine, because those are the major medicines that you may need to use for the delivery of thrombolytic therapy. We also have in the CT scanner room, IV start kits, IV tubing, two IV pumps, and uh, so that we can prepare the um, alteplase and the nicardipine infusions right there. We have pre-mixed um, nicardipine in the pixis. Uh, the ER nurse and the um, nurse coordinator from the uh, ICU mixes and administers the, the TPA 
under the direction of the neural provider. While they're preparing the TPA, uh, mixing it up and drawing it up and putting the tubing in, all that sort of thing, the neural provider is assessing the CTA of the head and neck. If it's a large vessel inclusion that they see and the aspect score is greater than five at this point in time, the neural provider then calls what we call a code stroke. And what that does is it activates the neurointerventional team to prep the interventional radiology room for a thrombectomy. We don't wait for the perfusion to be done to call that code stroke because we don't have the team present 24 seven. They're here day hours from seven to about four in the afternoon, uh, but they're not here on weekends or um, in the evenings or nights. So they have to come in from home, which can mean a 20 to 30 minute uh, delay in them being there. So the quicker that we can activate that team, the quicker we can get a response. Uh, the, um, while the uh, neurointerventional team is preparing uh, interventional radiology for the thrombectomy, the ER and um, ICU coordinator is preparing the patient by shaving the groin and getting the pants off, that sort of thing. And then the neural provider is getting the consent and discussing the case with the neurointerventionalist and the IR team leader. The patient is taken directly from the CT scanner to interventional radiology and has a report to the IR staff and interventional neuroradiology suite. The neurointerventionalist, the neural provider review the CT perfusion to, if indicated for further decision-making. This would be the patients between six and 24 hours. There are two, the second thing that we found that really helps is from the streamlining the uh, evaluation process that the next thing that really has helped us improve our times is by looking at our outcomes, both process data and patient outcomes. We have two fully dedicated program, stroke program coordinators and concurrent data um, registry uh, into the Get With the Guideline registry entry. So with each patient, we um, are working on collecting the data immediately after we produce the data so that we can have feedback in order to change our processes on a more fluid basis. These program goals are based on the identified needs based on the most recent data that we have. We also have weekly team meetings to review this data from our complex stroke patients. And we use that data to guide further process changes. We have a monthly review of year-to-date process and outcome trends. And that gives us a really good idea of what seems to be working and what's not working so that again, we can make further process outcome changes. This is an example of what we use to look at the individual patient data that is entered by one of the coordinators. So it just puts in the patient's FIN number, we have their name in there, what the uh, final diagnosis was, their mode of arrival, and then a synopsis of their hospital course. And then it, this is what's reviewed on a weekly basis. We um, also put down what was the likely stroke etiology. The physicians that were involved, this is the providers, um, that provided the TPA to the evaluation as well as the inpatient uh, physician and the interventionalist. And then we have the uh, length of stay therapies that they received. And then our times, we call it our times to everything. So we put down the last known well time, time arrival in the emergency department, when the ER physician first assesses the patient and when the um, provider from the back call arrived in the CT scanner room, what was the first NIH stroke scale that was determined what was that number? And then uh, when a stroke alert was called in, um, and then also when the bat call was initiated and when the code stroke was initiated. Then we have, if they received alt-place or TPA, then what was their door to needle time, door to CT time, and then door to CT results. For with us, it's when the provider read them at the CT scanner room, and then door to CT uh, brain perfusion. And then we put down the name of the uh, neurosurgeon who's doing the thrombectomy. And then this is the time from their arrival in the uh, ER to getting into the interventional suite. And then time from arrival in the ER to case start and time from arrival in the ER to uh, first puncture and then to vessel uh, access. That's our uh, first pass and then um, time to vessel open. And then we have a pre-tiki and a post-tiki 
And then we have opportunity to put down what the complications were like uh, IV blue or the patient need to be put on a ventilator, um, cardiac arrest, whatever it is that they have nausea, vomiting, a variety of different things can be complications, uh, unable to um, identify a last known well time uh, correctly, that sort of thing. And then we have our discharge disposition. And then if it's an un unanticipated death, um, just in general, what was the cause of that? And then the NIH and rank and discharge. And that we review um, on a weekly basis. And then this is an example of what has occurred with us. We set some goals. We found that our biggest problem in getting patients into thrombectomy or to TPA was the amount of time that we were looking at evaluation of the patient, evaluation of the imaging. So we set a goal for ourselves that a door to code stroke would be less than 30 minutes and our door to needle time less than 30 minutes. But we still follow the HA guidelines and we look at our door to needle at 60 minutes and 45 minutes also. And we found that by looking at door to code stroke in less than 30 minutes that we're able to really divvy up the, um, the duties uh, so that the uh, stroke coordinator is actually mixing the TPA and is preparing it for infusion in the patient, drawing up the bolus, and that the pro provider is just supervising that activity. And that frees up the provider to be looking at CTAs and to be making assessments for what is the next step of care, getting the consents done and that sort of thing. So what we found is that, as you can see here, that our door to calling these different things, the back call and the code stroke, all of it together, it follows our door to uh, groin puncture and our door to first pass times, it mirrors it. And so if we can shorten up the time that the patient uh, spends in the emergency department, that that shortens up the entire, that is a major place where we can gain benefit in getting our door to um, recanalization as short as possible. Two methods that we found that has done this the best has been that we use the, we personally use a van, but any scale you want to use for detection of a large vessel occlusion in the field, we have EMS report that to us. And that puts us in high alert. And actually, if the patient is van positive, we don't wait for a back call. We're actually meeting them at the door. Um, you know, this is a team that has to do all kinds of neural consultations and an admitting service. And, but when we see that a van positive patient's coming in, regardless of the last known well time, we go down to the ER just to make sure that this is not something that would require a thrombectomy or a TPA. The second thing that has improved our times is that we don't wait for the CT perfusion to be read. And if the patient has an aspect score that's favorable, that is greater than five, and they're within 24 hours, we start preparing them for a thrombectomy. And then we can always cancel a thrombectomy if the perfusion looks unfavorable and the decision is made not to proceed. But we always proceed by calling the code stroke and going ahead and preparing the patient getting them to where they need to be for a thrombectomy, assuming that that is what's indicated. And if it's not, then it's called off and we take the patient to the appropriate floor. So um, I don't know if I've exceeded my time or not, but that's um, the end of my talk and I'm gonna hand it over to the next person. Thank you, Dr. Tremwell. Our next speaker will be Dr. Amir Hassan. Hello, everyone. Okay. Should see my screen now. Everybody good? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of the research we've done on how artificial intelligence uh, improves care coordination and significantly improve treatment times and, and its effects and outcomes. Um, now, obviously, uh, here are my disclosures. So I consult for everybody. I work with all device companies, Genentech, uh, Balt, and Viz. So we were the first comprehensive stroke center uh, to install Viz in Texas. We were also the first in the Midwest uh, and the South to install it in a hub and spoke model. So one of the issues is the penetration of mechanical thrombectomy for large vessel occlusion isn't where it should be. Uh, we believe it's somewhere between 20 and 30%. Uh, the SVIN, our society, actually has a mission, uh, MT2020, and we're working with multiple societies, including the American Heart Association. And the idea was to increase mechanical thrombectomy. Basically, every two years, we would double it because we were able to reach our goal of worldwide 202,000 
mechanical thrombectomies by the year 2020. Now, we believe that it's actually 30%. 30% of acute ischemic strokes could receive mechanical thrombectomy. Now, if you go with a conservative number like 20%, as you can see here with the metro regions around uh, the country, Denver has the best penetration. It's approximately 9.3% of their acute ischemic strokes are treated with mechanical thrombectomy. On the other end, you have Washington, D.C. and San Antonio at 2.1%. So some of, this, uh, some of this conversation today also has to do with, with building a, a good hub and spoke network and how we can potentially improve uh, the number of patients who get treated. So this is a little bit about our program. We do about 1,300 neuro cases a year. Uh, we've steadily been increasing. We, you know, when we started back in 2012, we were a Swift Prime site. We were only doing like 40 mechanical thrombectomies a year, um, and then you know uh, we're about 250 mechanical thrombectomies a year now. Uh, we are three interventional neurologists. We cover two CSCs now. We have about uh, 11 hospitals that transfer in. It's a 566 bed hospital. Most of the information I'm going to be presenting about today, specifically about Valley Baptist. Um, in Harlingen and its sister hospital that is also owned by Tenet, uh, Valley Baptist Brownsville. So Valley Baptist, uh, th that CSC has three biplanes um, and was part of Swift Prime, Dawn, Select, and we currently have over eight acute stroke studies actively enrolled. So here's a little uh, picture uh, and a map of all of the uh, centers that transferred to us. So, um, now, some of these have their own CSCs now. So Doctors Hospital Renaissance, for example, in Edinburgh, McAllen Medical in, in McAllen, they've actually built their own CSCs. Uh, we actually helped cover McAllen Medical. One of our fellows went there. Um, but you can see here from Corpus Christi down to uh, Star County, all the way down uh, to Brownsville, everything's basically, you know, really it's coming to us. The, the complicated cases, um, mechanical thrombectomy cases, subarachnoid hemorrhages. San Antonio is about four hours. Austin's about five hours, Houston's about five hours. Um, and then as you can see here, the different, the, the miles uh, in some of these hospitals. So specifically, we're gonna be showing the data today from Brownsville. So as you all know, every minute saved uh, really does make a difference in someone's life. If you save one minute in a patient who's less than 55 years old, who has a large vessel occlusion with an NI stroke scale greater than 10, you actually, for every minute, give them an extra week of, of healthy life. So a 20 minute decrease in treatment delay is a three month gain of disability free life. So this was uh, originally an abstract to IEC 2020, uh, presenting our data, uh, our early experience using artificial intelligence showing the reduction in transfer times as well as the length of stay. And it was published in the Interventional Neuroradiology Journal uh, this past uh, fall. And basically, just to, to summarize some of the data, we looked at looking pre and post the implementation of an AI software like Viz. I mean, you can probably do this today with, with other softwares. I know there's Brainomics out there, Rapid. There, there, a lot of companies are, are competing with this. But the first elbow detection, the true artificial intelligence, uh, based on Ferdinand Hughes' paper, the evaluation of all the U.S. available softwares, the first and the only one that actually used artificial intelligence for alerting was this. So we, we, we chose that one. And then we looked at pre and post, what the difference was. And as you can see here, the historical workflow. Historically at Valley Baptist Brownsville, the CSC physician will be called, hey, I have a patient NIH greater than 10 or at six. I think the patient has an elbow, whatever they used. Uh, we used to use race. Uh, Dr. Tremble's presentation was excellent. Uh, we actually, after we invited Dr. Tullop down uh, for one of our symposium, uh, everybody here, all of the EMS companies in the county uh, fell in love with VAN. So we actually converted to VAN a few years ago. So let's say if patient's VAN positive or if they decide to use NIH, they would call us potential elbow patient. They're going to do the CT, decide or not, whether or not they're going to give TPA. They're going to do the CT angiogram. But that CTA has to be reconstructed by a tech, then read by a radiologist, who then calls the ED physician, who then calls the typically the, the stroke center neurologist, and then they'll call the house supervisor at their hospital who calls the house supervisor at my hospital who asks me whether or not I accept this patient. Very, very painful, long, tedious process. Today, the CSC confirms with us that they possibly have an elbow patient and you'll get the alert or you'll get the results on the app. And then we get alerted. The Viz alerts the whole team. 
and it alerts the neurohospitalist over there, the neurohospitalist here, ED physicians, whoever signs up to be on call. But the main people are the house supervisors, the ED physicians, and the interventional team, as well as the referring hospitals, hospitalists. So we saved from primary stroke center picture, the CTA done at the primary stroke center, to arrival at CSC, we saved over an hour. The average was 171 minutes prior to VIS, and it was down to 105 minutes. Right? There's certain things I can't change. I wish I could significantly improve door in, door out time at some institutions. I wish I could improve transfer time. Um, these things are improving, but they're not improving fast enough. So those results, um, th that time savings directly correlated to a 55% uh, neuro ICU uh, reduction in length of stay. So 39% reduction in time, 55% reduction in the neuro ICU length of stay. Now, uh, we, we took it one step further. So we said, okay, let's map this patient journey and see what's going on here. What else can we do? Uh, we have two major issues, right? We have the, the patients that are significantly delayed still. I still think 105 minutes is a long time. So they're still being delayed at the primary stroke center. Then you also have the patients who come in through our comprehensive stroke center. And what can we do to improve those times? So we took these as two different problems to solve and um, we, we worked on them and, and we have two different abstracts to present here. So one um, obviously is the pre-hospital arrival and what happens at the primary stroke center and their workup and how we can improve that transfer time. So this was presented um, virtually, right? Last ISC uh, was virtual, 2021. The implementation of artificial intelligence significantly reducing door in, door out at a primary stroke center. And then again, right, we just wanna look at this, this aspect of the, the stroke care uh, spectrum. And what we found was delays in door in, door out significantly, can significantly reduce a patient's ability to have a good primary outcome, especially 90 day modified ranking. Now the AHA has set goals, right? We have a goal now of door to needle, um, this is incorrect, door to needle 60 minutes, um, but it's door, I think this was supposed to be door to device, I'm sorry. So door to device time of 90 minutes for direct arriving elbow patients and 60 minutes if it's a transfer patient. And that makes sense, right? Um, if I know Valley Baptist Brownsville is transferring a large vessel occlusion, why would I repeat imaging? If the patient comes here quickly, um, within two hours, we do not repeat imaging for transfers. So the patient would come in, be wheeled in, uh, be screened to see if they need the airway protection, need to be intubated and go straight to cath lab. So that should be done within 60 minutes. Whereas when a patient comes in through your ED, especially on nights and weekends, this is our biggest problem is reaching this goal uh, because of the nights and weekends and holidays. Staff is not here and they get up to 30 minutes to come in. So there are delays there and we're working on, on ways to move around that. Um, and again, this is like, you know, 15 minutes of a much larger AI talk, like the, just the whole evolution of stroke care and, and AI. Uh, it's a really an hour presentation, but I tried to focus on uh, the most useful information. Um, I don't think you guys really care much about machine learning and, and all of the science behind the AI. So uh, comparing the time interval between door in, door out for all EVO patients from a single PSC, Brownsville, located here to our uh, comprehensive stroke center. So 23 mile distance, um, about uh, two, about one third of it is within a city, so not expressway, and then about two thirds is expressway. Uh, time period we looked at is February 2017 and November 2018, and then November 18 and June 2020, and we found a 45% reduction in door in door out. So remember earlier we had that 66 minute reduction from CTA to to um, CSC arrival, but now this is looking at total door in, door out time. So whether or not the patient got TPA or IV thrombolytics, um, you know, we, we typically exclude study patients from these. Um, so if the patient was enrolled in timeless, they wouldn't have been enrolled in this data. Um, but as you can see, uh, having this, and it's not just because of the large vessel occlusion alert, really. It's the whole team loves it, right? The neurohospitals team really loves having communication uh, with, with, you know, HIPAA compliant messenger. And they love the fact that they can open their phones and they look, hey, they got an alert, the CT was done. They get an alert, CTA is done. Then they get the OVO alert, right? Uh, usually about six minutes after the, the, the um, actual study is completed. 
And then if they did CT perfusion for late window patients, they would also look at that imaging. So you can also see here, uh, modified Rankin zero to two in these patients. We looked at these patients, 90 day modified Rankin and 28% of them had um, modified Rankin zero to two. By saving hundred minutes, you did have 40% of these patients had a modified Rankin of zero to two. So we know time directly correlates to good outcomes. So every minute saved really does make a big difference. So overall, it's about 11.4% raw improvement. But you know, if you do a relative risk reduction, it's, it's much higher. Let's see here. So uh, obviously key takeaways, right? Save time, uh, improve in outcome. So um, implementation of AI software also improves Dorian to puncture time as well as reperfusion rates at a CSC. Uh, so this abstract was also presented. And now we said, okay, let's just look at our CSC and all of these patients that we're trying to get, right? A door in to device time of 90 minutes. And are we improving? Are we getting better outcomes? Are we getting, um, you know, decreasing the actual treatment delivery times? Does having access to images immediately on your phone actually make a difference? And does the large vessel occlusion detection make a difference in getting that alert? And to be honest, I, I have to say, the majority of our strokes, I don't know, you know, every institution is a little bit different. The majority of our strokes are outside of eight to six, right? They are not when cath lab is here. 55% of our strokes are, are during either early hours, right? Wake up strokes, four, five, 6 a.m. Um, you know, patients coming in at night and, and the middle of the night and especially weekends and holidays. So the majority of our strokes are not during normal business hours. So we looked at 188 patients in, in this data set, 86 patients in the pre-AI group, 102 patients in the post-AI group. The other thing is obviously, is you pick up a lot more elbows, right? You might pick up elbows in low NIH patients. Now I know that's a whole different conversation. Uh, uh, we are part of the Endolo study. So we are gonna be looking at treatment of large vessel occlusion in patients with NIH less than six, but that's outside of the scope of this talk. But I just wanna say for those people who are looking uh, to build a program, I do think this, these things make it very valuable when you have any type of AI screening your CTAs for you. Um, so comparing the time interval in door in to groin puncture, measuring those times, looking at the modified ranking, mortality rates, length of stay, mass effect, and hemorrhages. So what we found was there was 86 minutes saved. So we saved 86 minutes. Um, and that led to Oh, and we had about an increase in 10% successful recanalization, modified TIKI 2B3. So obviously there's, you know, good things going on, improvement in access uh, in devices, trackability of devices, but there is a significant difference in time. Um, and again, that leads to the decreased length of stay. Again, published in Interventional Neuroradiology, 2.5 day reduction in total hospital length of stay since implementing um, you know, uh, large vessel occlusion detection artificial intelligence software. So in conclusion, implementation of uh, Viz AI in our institution, but this could probably be used with you know, other softwares. The key is making sure that you do have a true artificial intelligence detecting the large vessel occlusion. Um, it does even in an optimized. I mean, we used to pride ourselves on our steps T program and how fast we do things. Our average door needles like less than 30 minutes. So even in an optimized program, you do continue to improve your door to groin puncture time. And obviously we also uh, showed improvements in revascularization rates, reduce, uh, reduction in, in overall post-op complications, um, just getting the alert, everybody on, feeling that they're not rushed, right? It's a, it's a well-oiled machine. And then we're hoping that you know, further data actually does show this even at longer term outcomes and in patients that are typically not elbow candidates. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Um, great presentation. We have lots of questions coming in and we'll hold those to the end. And our next speaker will be Dr. David Wheeler. Dr. Wheeler. Thanks folks. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. I wanna to talk to you about um, the system of care for stroke in the, in the state of Wyoming. Um, sharing with you some experiences that, uh, that have been valuable to us in terms of improving treatment times. 
Um, so uh, Wyoming as a whole is the least populous state in the lower 48 with about six people per square mile. And more than half of our population live greater than an hour from their nearest hospital. Uh, these, these particular factors are associated with significantly higher uh, risk of uh, morbidity and mortality associated with stroke and other time sensitive emergencies in our state. And so we've been under uh, great moral pressure to build a system of care for stroke that helps us to overcome these geographic barriers. Um, one of the biggest challenges we've faced is, is coordinating the care of, of EMS personnel throughout the state. And, and uh, part of that is driven by the fact that there are so many diverse ways that uh, emergency medical services are, are delivered uh, with over 62 ground and 23 air services in the state. And about half of those ground services are, are volunteer services. So organizing uh, a system of care around such a diverse set of providers has been one of our biggest challenges. So uh, just a little background on, on how on what our system looks like. The Wyoming Medical Center in Casper is, is the, uh, the hub hospital for a, a statewide system of care. Um, we are a, a primary stroke center that is thrombectomy capable. Um, and we've gone through a, a number of iterations of, of uh, lean processes to make our, our uh, acute stroke or code stroke uh, inpatient here at Wyoming Medical Center, as well as the process of getting into the angio suite looks very much like what has been described by Dr. Tremwell. And we do use uh, rapid uh, AI to uh, facilitate the, the uh, evaluation of patients here. However, um, we haven't been able to deploy that kind of advanced imaging with any of our uh, spoke sites. And so uh, we're missing out on the potential opportunity for uh, even earlier activation of our stroke team that, that could be realized in that manner. Uh, so what what the things that we've done that I'd like to share that may be useful to those of you working on developing systems of care and shortening your treatment times are uh, looking, uh, looking especially at uh, what happens uh, in the pre-hospital setting. Uh, so first and foremost, of course, is educating our public on the signs and symptoms of stroke and the value of calling 911. Um, uh, in, in frontier communities like ours, there's a lot of resistance to using ambulance services because for, through a variety of reasons, but often, oftentimes people feel like they can get themselves to the ER more quickly by driving than by relying on ambulance. Uh, so some of our education uh, revolves around helping people understand why arriving through the ambulance bay and having a stroke team activated before they get to the hospital can really shorten their treatment times. Uh, in terms of EMS uh, training, we work really hard with them on their on their abilities to recognize the signs and symptoms of stroke as well, uh, and then uh, utilize whatever stroke severity scale is is uh, preferred by the company they, that they're working with. Um, we we've got a lot of diversity of approach there, but we're honing in on on several different scales, including VAN, that that have been particularly helpful in identifying LVOs in the in the field. And then finally, we are working towards a system-wide uh, process for triaging uh, to help help make decisions about whether or not to bypass local facilities. We do have rules and regulations in place that should facilitate this, but uh, as a practical matter, this hasn't happened yet, in part because we lack the funding for a, a statewide registry of, of resources and, and uh, we don't have statewide medical direction for these services. Uh, so these are, these are goals for the future that I think will really help to facilitate um, uh, getting patients to the right care more quickly. So our public education uh, uh, campaigns include uh, teaching about fast and be fast. We do community lectures on a regular basis throughout the state. Uh, we run public service announcements, especially during during uh, Stroke Awareness Month, but but throughout the year as well. We put um, uh, ads in the Meals and Wheels menus. We do billboards around the state. We run print ads and and extensive social media campaigns. Uh, with the support of the American Heart Association, which is greatly appreciated. Uh, in terms of EMS training, uh, we do as much as we can in-person training, and that's, that especially involves uh, real-time feedback to EMS providers as, as uh, we interact with them during code strokes. Uh, we do online lectures, uh, uh, either through the Department of Health for their required education, or sometimes we're asked by particular um, agencies to, to educate their providers, and we do so happily. Uh, we work very closely with the State Department of Health in terms of uh, developing new rules and regulations pertaining to uh, transport decision making in the field, uh, how to care for a stroke patient in the field, uh, and are 
again, grateful to the American Heart Association's recent efforts to develop a, a standardized uh, set of recommendations for how best to uh, uh, evaluate patients in the field and make uh, real-time uh, triage decisions. Um, Pre-hospital notification has been by far the most impactful thing that we've done throughout the state. Uh, we started this in our in our home county where Wyoming Medical Center is, and uh, that alone decreased our average door to CT time by about 10 minutes and our door to needle times by nearly 15 minutes. Uh, and we've been able to sustain that um, uh, those kinds of improvements since we put this process in place. And so recognizing how beneficial that's been within our organization, uh, we've made this a priority in terms of the uh, helping the spoke sites that we work with uh, up their game for door to needle times. And we are finding at least anecdotally that uh, those hospitals that regularly encourage pre-hospital notification and uh, activate code stroke before the patients arrive are, are seeing shorter door to needle times and shorter door in door out times. Um, we currently, the, the EMS providers, uh, if they're activating from the field or are communicating with their uh, local ER providers, uh, but we do see a, a point at some point in the near future being able to make the on-call neurologist at the hub facility available to those EMS providers using using either telephone or telestroke technologies. And finally, uh, the, the when the pre-hospital not notification occurs, either the stroke team at the local facility or the on-call neurologist will uh, collaborate with those EMS providers to uh, make decisions about where to take the patient. And this does happen fairly regularly uh, with uh, life flight scene calls. So when the helicopter goes out into the boonies to pick somebody up, they have to make decisions in the field about where to go. And in those cases, we often collaborate with those uh, with those EMS personnel, with those life flight personnel uh, to recommend bypassing the local facility if it makes sense in that case. Um, we, we have a code stroke process that looks very much like what's been described by the previous two presenters, and we are working diligently to uh, help our sister facilities enact similar processes, wherein a pre-hospital notification to the to the stroke center or to the stroke doctor occurs by EMS. EMS relays the results of their stroke assessment, which would include a, a severity scale to uh, try to screen for for LVOs. Uh, they they are required by state state uh, regulations to place an 18 gauge in the AC and check a finger stick blood glucose, and if it's within their um, uh, um, scope of practice to also draw blood for uh, delivery to the lab on arrival. Uh, the code stroke is activated at the local facility and an alert is sent out to, this, to the stroke providers, the lab CT and to the admissions folk. Uh, with the, with the <clears throat> sister facilities we work with who are part of our network, uh, oftentimes they will activate the telestroke system at the time that that pre-hospital notification occurs uh, at their facility and we are encouraging them uh, uh, unless they're one of the few facilities we work with that routinely keep patients at their facility after uh, treatment with uh, Altaplace, uh, we recommend that they activate uh, Life Flight or ACLS ambulance as soon as they uh, receive that stroke alert. And then finally, they they will get the the they'll activate the telestroke process or or make the telephone call. Uh, once the patient arrives, they're, they're quickly registered so that orders can be entered. Uh, an assessment is done either by the stroke neurologist who's met the patient in the ER or by the ER physician that fits an outlying facility. Uh, if it's one of our telestroke hospitals that the telestroke neurologist will be uh, on the system at the same time that the patient arrives um, and able to evaluate them. Uh, uh, well, we, we typically would interact with EMS providers and or family uh, or anybody else who can provide information about the patient while the patient is off getting their CT scan. Then we review their CT scan on the telestroke platform and are able to uh, uh, work with the results of that CT and evaluate the patient as soon as they come back from CT uh, and often provide recommendations about mixing TPA or Altaplace at that point. Um, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have advanced imaging at, at any of our sister facilities. Um, some of them are routinely doing CT angiograms, especially if, if uh, the the uh, severity screening tool indicates the high likelihood of an LVO. Um, and uh, if a CTA is done in the field, um, we unfortunately are not able to do perfusion scans at those facilities. So once they arrive at our facility, we're uh, still routinely repeating the stroke protocol CT and sending that data through rapid for, for further assessment. Um, 
so we all understand that getting the neurologist involved early is a, is a critical part of, of uh, uh, improving door to needle times and door in door out times. Uh, and we use our telestroke system to uh, facilitate this process. Uh, so the Wyoming Telestroke Network uh, includes our hub hospital at, in Casper, which is kind of in the middle of the state. And then we have 10 facilities that are uh, actively participating in the program and uh, three more that we expect to be coming on board in the next six months or so. Uh, so those 13 hospitals account for a little over half of the hospitals in the state. Um, the hospitals on the uh, western border of the state tend to send their, their patients to Salt Lake City and those on the southern border tend to send their patients towards Denver. Um, but Casper, where we sit uh, in the middle of the state there, is, is 275 miles away from the nearest comprehensive stroke center. And so even though we're a overall a low volume state, we're, we're far enough away from any other uh, thrombectomy capable or comprehensive stroke centers that we need to be able to provide this service in order to save the lives of our, of our fellow citizens. Uh, our telestroke network uh, was launched in November of 18, and this shows the, the addition of sites over time uh, with uh, currently at 10 sites as of, as of uh, today. And here's the, the overall growth in the number of monthly consults. And you can see by looking at the y-axis that we're still averaging right around 22 or 23 telestroke consults a month. So again, low volume, uh, not, enough, not enough cases here for me to provide you with explicit statistics about, about pre-performance of our program before and after initiation of telestroke. Uh, uh, and we also are not able to provide uh, clear data about, about uh, door to needle and door out times because none of the facilities we work with are participating and get with the guidelines. So the work of the, of the primary stroke center here in Casper and, the, and, our, and our goal of leading the development of, of a statewide system of care is uh, uh, we really see a, um, uh, as the most important next steps is getting uh, as many of those uh, uh, facilities we work with to begin participating in some kind of uh, data registry. Uh, and then we think that we, we feel that we need to develop a, a statewide system for uh, triage so that we have a, a real time snapshot of the available resources and have some medical direction that can help making triage, help make triage decisions about uh, where best to transport patients based on the available resources at any given time. And then I think finally, especially after hearing Dr. Hassan's uh, speech, I think it's uh, really important that uh, in, the, in the coming years that we uh, work with our sister facilities to start uh, using advanced imaging and, uh, and artificial intelligence to, to better identify patients who may benefit from, from urgent transfer and thrombectomy. So that's, uh, that's what I've got to say today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wheeler. Great presentations from all of our physicians. So um, we have several uh, questions here. So I'm just gonna start at the top here. And I believe the first one was for, for Dr. Trimwell. And it is, my facility is currently discussing doing overhead page for stroke alerts. I'm curious if anyone has recently made this change and how that has affected their times. Actually, this could be for anybody. Well, we, we've been doing the overhead stroke alerts all along and it is helpful because the ER physician to be in any room or anywhere. So they'll hear that they have um, a need to go to the CT scanner to examine that patient. Any comments from our other speakers? We, we do overhead uh, alerts for inpatients at our facility. Um, in, our, in our ER, it's a small enough place that you can hear the radio calls coming in, so it wouldn't be necessary there. Yeah, no, we, uh, where I trained uh, back at Rutgers, uh, UMDNJ with Qureshi, when I went to Minnesota, they did it. Uh, when I came here, uh, we implemented it. So yes, we've always been doing it. Very useful. Thank you. Um, next question's for Dr. Tramwell. How often do you call the IR team in at night based on aspect and CTA, but then call them off with a non-favorable CTP? First of all, we've been using the aspect for probably about five months now. So we haven't been using it for a long, long time, but we have yet to have to call them off uh, because of an aspect confusion discrepancy. We find that the aspect score, in particular, we've all taken very clean to train ourselves to do it right. It seems to be a good predictor of uh, penumbra in the patient. So we compare the aspect score with the patient's exam. So if they have a pretty devastating exam, and yet their CT shows an aspect score 
uh, something that is um, uh, higher than five, then usually we find a penumbra that is suitable to that, you know, similar to that. So, so in our institution, uh, we, we typically would just call them off if they uh, did not meet study criteria. Because even if a patient has, uh, you know, sometimes it's like a borderline. It's like you'll give an aspect of six, but the CTP might come back with over 70 mLs of infarct. In those patients, we're enrolling them in Select 2. So we're one of the, the sites for the large course studies. Um, but if they don't meet study criteria, yes, we would cancel the team. Okay. Um, for all three of you, what is your best and average door to needle time? Our, my, our best door to needle time was, was 14 minutes and our average is about 28 minutes at, in Casper. Question regional, all I can tell you is that- So, yeah, so uh, uh, Dr. Trimble, I, I think she's- Anyways, we found that 65% um, of our patients get a door to needle less than 30 minutes and 86 is less than 45 minutes. Everybody is less than an hour. Yeah, our, our numbers are very similar to hers, but Dr. Techley, I, I personally, I think I'm like maybe like 10 or 11 minutes, but Dr. Techley has one that's six minutes. He basically waited at the bay when he heard the patient was coming in, went with the patient to CT, and they went straight and just CT head negative, give the TPA right now. <laughs> that, that's how I got that 14 minutes. So I'm, I'm not sure what else I could do to go faster. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, next question. We have, wait a minute. Yeah, we have never called off the thrombectomy. Our experience is aspect score is a reliable indicator for thrombectomy. Of 543 patients, somebody already said this. All right, ischemic stroke patients last year, 22% received thrombectomy. 60% of our patients received thrombolysis under 30 minutes with 86% within 45 minutes. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, I'm sorry, I was, I didn't realize I wanted to talk about it. Um, you're cutting out, Dr. Tremwell. Um, I'm apologizing. That, that was me. I was typing the answer to the questions. I didn't realize that we were going to talk about them. I was oh. answering, so that was me. I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. Hey, Dr. Hassan, does your team start to come in with the artificial intelligence occlusion alert or from a code stroke page? So now we have made it, in order to get the... Um, door to device of 90 minutes. It's um, if the patient's NIH is greater than 10 or they're van positive, uh, they're getting called in. We do not even wait for imaging to get started because otherwise we will not reach the 90 minute goal. Okay. Um, here's another question for Dr. Hassan. Do you activate T based on the um, inner, <laughs> Artificial intelligence, no, IA mobile alert, or do you still wait for the radiologist to activate the team? Oh, no, 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 we, we, we uh, activate the team. I, I'll even activate the team sometimes when I'm looking at the source images before the AI has even picked it up, which is on average six minutes. Like if I just happen to be free and, oh, look, the CTA is done already. I, I start looking through it and I'll call the team um, and alert them. We definitely don't wait for radiology. In-house, we never did. But at the spokes, they do. Um, I don't have a cool setup like David does. I can't access their images. I cannot access any of my spokes images. Now we can access uh, Valley Baptist Brownsville, McCallum Med, I think Rio Grande Region. We have like three or four hospitals that signed up for Viz. So now I have access to their uh, CT, CTAs, and CTPs. Okay. Um, do you call the primary stroke center to let them know that you're sending the patient? Say that one more time, I'm sorry. Do you call the primary stroke center to let them know to send the patient? Oh, sorry, I said that wrong. No, 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 no. it's all done through the, the app. So I'll send them a, it's a HIPAA compliant messenger. So once that elbow alert is on, usually the neuro hospitals there is calling me. He's like, hey, this patient's being packaged. We already called EMS. Like I have an awesome team over there. I mean, very, very good colleagues. Um, and then when we're done here, I'll take a picture of the recalization and send it back through that same HIPAA compliant messenger. But yes, if, if they happen to be busy and they're not seeing that patient, I, through the messenger, will be like, transfer the patient. And Valley Baptist Brunswick ED and Valley Baptist Harlingen ED both have iPads with Viz installed. 
Okay. It, in, in Casper, the whole team is the neurologist and the interventionalist. So, so we talk <laughs> to each other standing next to each other in this. Exactly. Season. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in-house, yeah. In-house, like at Mothership, that's the, that's the way it goes. Um, um, I found here a question about limited to neurology. So, so when I came here, I started working with a, a cardiac cath lab. And I actually love the fact that I trained, both programs I trained at, it was with radiology. But when I came here, they decided to put me with cardiology and I love it. I mean, these guys really understand time because of STEMI. Um, and there's always two teams on call. We have a call team and a backup team. Okay. Um, here's another question comment. We currently have Viz AI, but do not feel we are maximizing its potential like Chad, et cetera. Outside the LVO suspension alert, what other functionalities do you feel make the biggest difference in using AI? And how did you get the community hospital buy-in for this valuable applica application? So, so the, the only true AI in all of these apps <laughs> and is the actual ELVO detection and the alert. That's the only part that AI is part of. But whether this, the CTP, like those pretty pictures of red and green, that my kids now can tell me, hey, Bubba, you're gonna go in for a stroke. You know, <laughs> they even look at them now. It's that's not AI. That's just some software. That's just, you know your your bread and butter typical software. Rapid has been doing it for a decade, and now Viz does it. There's Brainomics and other softwares who do it. Uh, there is value in that, I think, uh, for institutions that don't have a lot of stroke neurologists as the neurohospitalist. So in some of my spokes, they don't have a stroke neurologist. Patients really never did stroke fellowship or anything like that. Um, and they just did four years of neurology residency and now they're neurohospitals. I think the app helps them, but you know, within a year, they're usually pretty good at it as well. So they, they pick it up pretty quickly. I think that the big thing to, to talk to your institutions, um, uh, if you wanna get your spokes to buy in is the new NTAP payment. I think that's the biggest thing. It's, it's a gift from Medicare to, to institutions. Um, because they will more than cover the cost of the one-year subscription for the whole, the CT, the CTA, and the CTP part of it, um, with all of that money that's going to come in through NTAP uh, for the patients that would be transferred, um, and all the patients that are analyzed using using that software. Uh, from a chat function, we find it very useful because a lot of patients don't meet criteria, uh, like we just mentioned earlier, a large core infarct. So that patient, if it's out of spoke, they get transferred here to be enrolled in select two, right? That is, uh, you're offering more for your patient population, uh, for your, your hometown, right? Uh, I think it's extremely important. We've improved enrollment in studies by 25% uh, after implementation of this because the chat feature is so cool. We're all looking at images together. You know, the neuro hospitals uh, have been a great help. Great, okay. Um, for thrombectomies, do you always use general anesthesia? And what is your stance on invasive lines, foleys, and lines for treatment? And line so, for treatment. So never, no, and it's a it waste time. <laughs> Same here. Okay, let's see. Um, that one we've got. Have you found a way to integrate the chat function of Viz into the medical record for billing purposes? Um, I believe there they have something coming out soon uh, that's going to implement a lot of the stuff that we do now in and, and push it back into, uh, I, I believe it's already working with Epic and they're working on Cerner and the other um, EMRs, but that is that is coming out very, very soon. Um, where, for example, the idea is like um, ED physician, for example, uh, sees the patient and says, hey, NIH is six, just FYI, NIH is six. And he puts that in there. Um, we can then all of this information, uh, if, if my research nurse went and collected the real door to, I'm sorry, the real onset time, she would put that in the, in the app as well. And then that would be pushed to the medical record. Um, and then it's, I, I think that between the chat feature, um, you know, the, the actual elbow detection, um, you know, the actual AI portion of it, it's not just pushing every single patient to me. That's the real big difference between the two. I see someone ask the anonymous attendee why choose uh, Viz versus Rapid. Um, it is actually AI, right? And and we use we're, we have Rapid installed in our hospital because of certain studies, right? To be part of Timeless, you have to have Rapid. Um, but I, I have to tell you, just the, when you have to download um, 
on your phone, like you're at home or your kids are playing with your phone and you have to look at that CTA, it's in less than five seconds. I can reconstruct that whole CTA and I'm looking at it from neck to the circle of Willis. And I can see if there's something, uh, whether it was overread or if it's missed. Uh, Rapid, it's a very large file. It has to download like 150, 200 megabytes. So if you're on LTE, that takes a very, very long time. Okay, looks like that's the end of our time. Um, but really, thank you. Thank, thanks to all three of our experts. Um, excellent presentations. We really appreciate your expertise in sharing that. And thank you for everyone who joined us today. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks, everybody. Have a great thank rest of your day. Everyone. Great to see Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye now.